What if the Russians landed on the moon first? What if JFK didn't win the election in 1960? What if Skylab got saved by the space shuttle? In today's episode, we take a brief look at alternate histories. Plus, we'll be covering the latest news from the world of space to keep you up to date. And as always, a little reminder about our social media. You can follow us at Space and Things 1 on Twitter or get involved at Space and Things Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. Thanks again for tuning in and supporting our podcast. But right now, we hope that you enjoy episode 20 of the Space and Things Podcast. You're listening to the Space and Things Podcast with Emily Carney and Dave Giles. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles. And welcome to episode 20 of our podcast. It feels like a milestone now. I know. 20 episodes already. Almost, uh, that's like almost six months practically. I mean. I think it's crazy, isn't it? It's that's crazy. crazy. We're, it, we're nearly nearly halfway through the year. It doesn't um, feel like it. Emily, I actually have an apology uh, for the last show. Okay. I realized this as, <laughs> literally, as it was about to go live, I was uh, putting together the show notes. And I noticed that one of the stories we put in the news section was one month old. <laughs> uh, that's okay, though. That's okay. We I, Our listeners probably hadn't heard about it, so... Uh, it's, yeah. it's not a terrible... Not a, not a terrible mistake. It's not like... We said something outrageous, you know. That's that's true. the 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 radish story on the ISS was uh, was was actually from November the thirtieth. I got scuppered by someone updating a news article, and therefore it appeared in the latest news section. Uh, so so it's partly not my fault. Oh uh, well. That's my mitigation. That's my mitigating circumstances. I should still have checked the date on the original article. It won't happen again. Uh, so, <laughs> on that note, shall we just should we get cracking on that with the latest news stories? We probably should. <laughs> let's get crack. Let's <laughs> let's get let's get cracking. And I assure you, they've been properly researched this week. <laughs> let's get crack. Yeah, let's crack on then. I'm sorry, I almost <laughs> oh, did better. it. It's- I almost it's a little did bit better it. This it's a, week. slightly be- a little better, not much. Yeah. You, you've been eating more Cadbury's chocolate. Have yes, you? yes, mm. <laughs> yeah. Very. I have. It's really. Do- I found out who sent it. Actually, um. Oh, excellent. My mother-in-law excellent. sent it, and she is listening to this. So, Lila, thank you very much. That was very uh, sweet. So, that thank is very you. sweet. Now I'm becoming well, British. Thank you. Well, we know you're fully converted when you start ordering it from uh, from various websites to to, to arrive. You- all on your own without it being a gift then we know you're one of us i'm probably gonna start uh doing underground stuff to get the british chocolate like i a few a few people from like scotland and other places have like reached out to me like uh do you need a hookup and i'm like i feel like i'm doing drugs or something like i feel like i'm like hey um do you have crack like or something can, can, can you can you sort me out with some of that uh some of that stuff from bourneville Yes, I need that. I need need that stuff. I need it now. Man, I need the brown stuff really bad. (laughs) Anyway, that's a massive, uh, massive sidestep. There, let's get going. Yes, yeah, let's get, let's, uh, let's get going. Yeah. If you got a minute, I think we owe you a report on strawberries and pork loin. In a week when Elon Musk became the richest man in the world, SpaceX got the honor of having the first launch of 2021. The Falcon 9 rocket launched from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Yes, that's the Space Force Station in Florida on January 7th at 9.15 p.m. and carried the Turksat 5A communications satellite for Turkey. It was the fourth launch for this particular Falcon 9 first stage, which landed on the drone ship called Just Read the Instructions eight and a half minutes after liftoff. Yep, uh, we're finally off and running with our launches this year, so... uh... Nice one, SpaceX. And while we're talking about SpaceX, the SN9 Starship prototype is now out on the pad at their Boca Chica facility in South Texas. Uh, They completed the first static firing of their engines uh, on the 6th of January. And although there have been some complications with the second of these tests, it is anticipating that it could be happening tonight as we're recording. Uh, that's Tuesday the 12th of January, um, with a potential test flight happening by the end of the week. And after all the excitement of the uh, SN8 
test flight towards the end of last year, this is definitely something to keep an eye out for. And uh, we will be retweeting any live streams of this launch when it happens. Meanwhile, uh, NASA have confirmed that a green run test of the Space Launch System, or SLS, which is the huge rocket that will send crews to the moon as part of the Artemis program, could happen before the end of the month. Uh, this involves the firing of uh, the four core stage RS-25 engines for eight minutes at the Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. Uh, these are the same type of engines that were used on the space shuttle. Uh, should this test be as successful, NASA and Boeing will refurbish the core stage, then send it to Florida for final assembly as they prepare for the first uncrewed launch of the rocket. Um, hopefully, we're going to be seeing that at some point this year. That would be fantastic. And, yes. Uh, you, you may or may not remember <laughs> that back in 2009, NASA's Kepler Space Telescope identified what it thought was a candidate to be an exoplanet and named it KOI-5AB. Really catchy name there. Well, astronomers <laughs> have finally confirmed that this Neptune-sized planet does actually exist. Um, for those of you who don't know, an exoplanet is a planet outside of our solar system. And the Kepler telescope has so far discovered two-thirds of the roughly 4,300 known exoplanets. And, uh, and this one is approximately 1,800 light-years from Earth. And it's in the constellation Cygnus. It's taken a long time to confirm this one uh, because with all the data that came from Kepler, there was so much research that had to be undertaken. And this was one of the more tricky assignments due to the fact that the main star has a companion star, uh, which means the data was a lot more complicated. Um, so so complicated that, I'll be honest, I'm struggling to figure out how to explain it simply. Um, so if you're interested <laughs> okay. in this story, uh, I'm going to put some links into the show notes. It is actually really fascinating and, and a great discovery. It is really fascinating to read about that stuff. I'm not really an astronomy expert. Uh, that's a little out of my range <laughs> of yeah. knowledge, but uh, it's really awesome to read about those kinds of discoveries because uh, we had no idea. Yeah, so it's it's really crazy. The diagrams, essentially there's two stars and the planet kind of is in a weird orbit that kind of gets messed up by both of them. It's it's really odd. Like That's you can't really you odd. can't really imagine it, but they've they've figured it out and got diagrams, which I'm trying to get my head around. So as I said, I'll post some links so people can check it out. All right. Awesome. And finally, earlier today on a Tuesday, we tape on Tuesday, a SpaceX Dragon cargo ship undocked from the International Space Station and is heading back to Earth loaded with 5,200 pounds of scientific experiments and other supplies, which is about uh, 2,360 kilograms for the metric folks out there. This will be the first landing of one of the cargo ships in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Florida. So maybe I'll hear it. Yeah. I might hear it. Seriously. Um, up until now, they have all landed uh, off the coast of California, uh, where the ship has been returned to the SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne. It was planned to have landed uh, in the Atlantic off the coast of Florida last night, but that was canceled due to uh, bad weather in the landing area. Uh, this upgraded uh, Dragon cargo ship was launched on the 6th of December and was able to stay docked to the ISS twice as long as the previous uh, Dragon cargo ship. So that, I might actually hear it pass over here because I am I live next to the Gulf of Mexico. That would be amazing. Nice, uh, yeah. nice re-entry sonic boon for you, but it's been a while, I guess. It's well, you know, this is this is crazy. Um, when the X thirty seven, the 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 secret secret, <laughs> I'm doing quotation marks. The secret space plane landed, um, a while back. I want to say last year, maybe the year before, sometime. I forgot which when we weren't supposed to know about it. I didn't know <laughs> about it, but I swear to God, I'm not making this up. I um. It was early in the morning, and I, it was on a weekend, I think, and I was just chilling, and I hear a sonic boom, like double the, you know, and I was like, I haven't heard that really since the space shuttle. That's weird. And I assumed that um, we live mm, sort of close to MacDill Air Force Base, so I assumed that, oh, maybe it's some plane flying over there for some reason made a sonic boom, and I just, I put it out of my mind. And then a few hours later, it's like, the X-37B has landed at Kennedy Space Center. And I'm like, that's what that was. So that was kind of neat because um, 
at first I was like, man, the space shuttle's coming back. And I'm like, wait, no, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> During the shuttle program, that was like, you would hear it like frequently. Yeah, it was yeah, like yeah. a rite of passage. Like you'd just be chilling in your house, eating dinner and all of a sudden, boom, boom. And you're like, oh yeah, they're landing soon. That It was really cool. And, uh, and I believe that gets you up to date with this week's news. We have, we have no intention of competing with the professionals, believe me. So, after we recorded last week's episode, Emily and I had a bit of a planning meeting to discuss some of the events of, of this year that we'd like to cover. Uh, and it's got potential to be a vintage year, and we're putting together a list of what's coming up, both in terms of new missions and things in the future, and looking back at some of the milestone anniversaries of some of our favourite events. But today, we're not going to be talking about either of those things. Instead, we're going to look at the fictional world of alternative histories, uh, that this is when an author tries to predict what might happen had events have turned out differently. Uh, and while these are very common in, to history events in general, in terms of space, there are also plenty of authors who deliver this kind of content. And we are all for it. Uh, in February of this year, and we hope to cover this uh, when, it, when it airs, Apple TV will be releasing season two of For All Mankind, which is a show that tries to show what it might have happened had the Russians landed on the moon before the Americans did back in 1969. Uh, while it uses a number of real-life characters who we know and love, it also throws in some fictional ones too. And uh, and both Emily and I loved season one. So, Emily, you're a big fan of this kind of concept. I, I only really know For All Mankind in terms of what I have actually uh, absorbed. Um, so if people want to get into this kind of thing, what, what do you recommend? Are there, you know, are there particular authors that really excel at this kind of, uh, at these kind of books or are there other shows which you think that, that people might like to watch? I mean, you're more well-versed on this than I am. Well, um, there's a lot of really neat books and um, there's a few movies out there that kind of have an alternate, you know, space history flavor to it. And I'll try to go through uh, some of them here. Um, as far as, well, we talked about For All Mankind just now. And the second season is coming out on February 19th, which is incidentally my birthday. So happy birthday nice. to me. <laughs> I am so freaking excited about this because uh, I got the patches uh, for the second season. Uh, it was actually a Christmas present. And, oh, nice. Um, I got the autograph, uh, the patches that are autographed by Ronald D. Moore, the, the gentleman who created the series. And um, I am so excited about this because I don't know if the patches are going to be like a predictor of what's on the show this season. Some of the fans have been speculating, like, what's going to happen on the show next season? Like, uh, they got a few Skylab patches. So I'm like, is Skylab going to make an appearance? And in what um, I'm wondering in what capacity it's going to make an appearance, you know, because uh, if anybody has seen the previews for the next season, it looks like, you know, the United States and the Soviet Union are in, are in quite a skirmish. So I'm wondering, is Skylab actually going to be used for like science or is it going to be just an arsenal? Like, I have no idea. So I'm kind of uh, interested to see what happens there if they use Skylab at all, if also, on one of the patches, it says the name Young on it. And I'm like, are they bringing John Young into this? Like, oh, my nice. God, is, who's going to play him? You know, yeah. somebody really hot. But yeah, because that was one of the that was one of the things they changed, didn't they? From uh, in, in the alternate history of this world, uh, Apollo 10 didn't have Tom Stafford, John Young and Gene. Sermon. No. They, they put three other astronauts in. No, it was Ed Baldwin, Gordo Stevens and some other dude. I guess yeah. in the command module, <laughs> some other dude in the command module. Sort of like Apollo 15 didn't have, you know, Warden, Irwin, and Scott. It had Baldwin, Cobb, and uh, some other dude. I forgot the command module pilot. Oh, <laughs> God, that's so awful. Uh, people always forget in the command module I pilots. I know. I feel horrible yeah, They're, they're going to send a union round and have a word with you soon, Emily. Yes. Yeah. Al's in heaven <laughs> right now, like. Get just like, ah, like yelling yeah. at me. Like, <laughs> how could you forget that? But anyway... <laughs> It's a great show, though. I mean, the, the soundtrack is just divine. Yes. I mean, it, my, 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 my worry about it, and I don't know, as someone, like, obviously you've read more of, the, of these kind of books as well, the further it gets away from the point of history which we know, does it get more ridiculous? At the first few episodes, or the whole of season one, in, in fairness, I kind of thought was not necessarily all believable but all within because obviously it's a it's a fictional show and that they took a lot of liberties with various things but 
most of it are concepts which you could kind of see versions of happening had that history have happened. Mm -hmm. If you keep going further off to the extremes, it can get a bit ridiculous. And I hope they don't get so ridiculous that I end up not wanting to watch it because I yeah. really enjoyed season one. Yeah, I'm kind of wondering um, how they're going to tackle the issue of Star Wars <laughs> and, um, you know, kind of the fight between... Uh, the Soviets and the United States in space. They're going there this season, and I'm kind of wondering how they're going to do that because um, this is actually funny. I, I was doing some research recently. I, I, I've uh, I've been studying, you know, kind of the life and career of uh, Gerard K. O'Neill <laughs> a lot recently. I, I name-dropped him finally in this show for this week. <laughs> and um, <laughs> there was a, a group, like a, a non... I think a non-profit. It was... It was like an enthusiast group in the 1970s and 80s called the L5 Society. And uh, during the 1980s, when Star Wars was introduced, the uh, the Strategic uh, Defense Initiative and all that, it was called Star Wars kind of as a joke. Yeah. It was kind of a hot button topic within the L5 Society because there were people that supported it within the society. And there were people who were like, absolutely not. You know, so it mm -hmm. was really sort of a fight in there over that particular topic i'm really curious how the show is going to handle that if they're going to have kind of a similar group or discourse discourse about this issue yes so i'm really curious how mm. they're going to handle that because that's something i've been sort of looking into lately just as to how did uh gko <laughs> gerard k o'neill how did he <laughs> handle this but you know what were his feelings about this particular topic himself and what were his enthusiast groups of uh, his followers thinking about, you know, during this time. So the show might be kind of interesting. I'm wondering if they're going to tackle that or not. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and of course that, you know, without getting too political, you know, United States, as we mentioned earlier, does now have a space force. So this yes. is, you know, can, can also ring true with, with some of, of the discussions that are going on today about whether that's appropriate uh, or, and, and people's thoughts about um, whether that should be a thing or not. Yeah. And there will also be the the haters out there who don't like any of the factual inaccuracies uh, or just people that forget that this is an alternate history. This is a piece of fiction. It's not real. It's uh, similar to like, like what we mentioned when we were talking about the right stuff, which isn't an alternate history. Uh, but season one of this got a lot of criticism from hardcore space fans. Uh, and then when the, when the trailer came out for season two and there was a shot of the space shuttle looking like it was returning from the moon, oh, people kicked off about how inaccurate that is because the space shuttle could never have gone to the moon. But we're living in a different history now. Like, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really matter. And we don't know if they used, like, Skylab as sort of a way station. Yeah. Ostensibly, they could have done that because there was a, a, you know, a fixture to put an Apollo capsule. So they may have done something like that. I mean, I don't know how technically possible that is, doing the math in my head. But maybe they used, a like, a sort of a mid-space station, like a, a space station between the Earth and the moon to do something. That That's my guess because that... To me, that would make the most sense, and that would explain the presence of Skylab in the mission patches. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, for sure. Just something I'm thinking about. But 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 ultimately, it doesn't matter too much. And I think yeah. that when, when people, if you're going into watching these shows or reading these books, you're reading fiction. You're watching yeah. fiction, and 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 you have to take everything with a pinch of salt. But it's also quite good fun. I, I think particularly I. I've seen you post. I've seen other people post these kind of things, and 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 we're all within within the space fandom. Uh, we're all guilty of doing this. You know, what if Gus Grissom hadn't died? What you know, yeah. would he have been the first man? Who would have been the first person to walk on the moon? All those kind of stories. That's all our own versions of doing an alternative history. Yeah. So we, we all kind of do these things anyway. What would have happened if Apollo thirteen had not have had the accident? All these kind of things. We have these what ifs. So the fact that some authors have actually gone to the effort of saying, "I'm actually going to pursue my trail of thought," is inherently interesting. How, you know, as an author, Emily, is this something that you've ever considered doing? Yes, actually. Um, uh, boy, I love alternate histories. Um, I, I wrote a short one for Quest in summer uh, 2019, uh, Quest magazine, which is like the space history periodical. It's a, a, it's a quarterly. It uh, came out with a, a what if issue. 
some of the scenarios were, you know, what if Apollo 8 hadn't gone well? What if the outcome between JFK and Nixon had been different? Yeah. You know, just stuff like that, you know, and these are questions that a lot of space historians sort of think about. So I chose to do a, what if Gus Grissom had lived? And I had a lot huh. of fun with it. Like, I'm sure some people probably read it and thought, well, this would never happen. He would never do this. But I actually consulted with two uh, writers, two, two fellow writers. Uh, I consulted with Francis French and Laura Owensby and had them look over it because they know quite a bit about Grissom because I wanted to make it realistic enough that it would it sounded like him yeah it, you know i wasn't just you know okay yeah he woke up one morning put his shoes on and went you know to a rocket i wanted to make it give him a real flavor of okay this is gus talking yeah and i had an awesome time writing this i loved it so um i can't believe i'm admitting this admitting this i am currently working on a Skylab alternate history i even have the crew picked out and i'm that's all i'm nice. gonna say <laughs> so I have a crew and it takes place. I'll give one spoiler. It takes place during the late seventies, not the early seventies. Okay. So, and one okay. of the crew members is, I'll tell you in private, of course, now everybody's been like, damn it. <laughs> but, uh, one of the crew members kind of has an unexpected role. So it's somebody you wouldn't expect to be in their position. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, th well, that opens up a new idea. So, uh, Listeners, if you could figure out who Emily would choose uh, in her <laughs> alternate Skylab world, uh, then you won't win anything. But please send in your answers. Pick your three astronauts you think that Emily would love to have had on a Skylab crew in the late 70s. Uh, drop your answers in on a postcard. Awesome. All right, Houston Skylab 2. We fix anything. We've got a pitch and a roll program. So, Emily, I, I consider you to be a bit of an expert on this. So where should we be looking uh, to find more of these alternative histories? Are they mainly books uh, or are they blog posts? Who are the authors we should be looking out for? Who are the key players? Well, that's a that's a great question. Um, there's a few things that I'll talk about that uh, uh, one of them I can think about is a uh, two of well, two of them actually are bloggers or writers. Um, a few of them are books. And a few of them are, one of them's, you know, the Quest magazine that I previously mentioned. I believe it's still available on their website for purchase. If you go look on mm. uh, the Quest website, I think their website is spacehistory101.com or something like that. But let me go, I have a list here and I'll just go through it. I'll start kind of with the history, the beginning of alternate histories, which I'll just start with like the beginning of human programs. Um, there was an yeah. author back in the day, he's no longer with us, but his name was Martin Caden. He was a huge character in uh, the 1960s in Cape Canaveral. He was, uh, he was kind of a folk hero down there. Anyway, he did a few books that uh, were sort of alternate histories. It had um, elements of the real space program, but it introduced some you know, other characters in there. But two of the books that I've read of his that I, that I enjoyed were uh, Marooned which later became a uh, movie. And the movie is kind of loosely based on the book. There's a lot of differences in the book. The book involves a Mercury astronaut, whereas the movie is about Apollo. Okay. So there's some differences there. He also did a book called The Cape, which is kind of trashy, but I enjoyed it. It's sort of a trashy... I don't want to spoil it too much. There's a, some interesting compromising situations in that book. So we'll just put it at that. <laughs> That's if you want to go kind of old school and, um, you know, kind of go to the beginning of alternate fictions about the space program. In the 60s, there was a series called Julie Jones, Cape Canaveral Nurse. I'm not making this up. No way. Yes, I have a I have the first book and it's from like 1962 and she looks like Dee O'Hara. So it's probably based <laughs> on her. I think there's an Apollo nurse book as well. These are loosely based on those programs and um they're really romance novels but if you're interested in that time and you're not grossed out by romance novels um it's they're <laughs> fun to read just kind of as a snapshot of oh, okay that's you know that's how they're trying to appeal the space program to women i guess back then i don't know <laughs> so anyway, moving forward, uh, back in the 90s, and I'm probably missing a lot of stuff. Uh, I'm sure there's more alternate space histories that I've missed. 
In the 80s and 90s, there was a book by uh, James Mishner called Space. I'm embarrassed to say I have not read it yet. A friend of mine gave it to me, and I need to read it. But I've been told uh, it's quite good. It's a big one. It's uh, It discusses a lot of you know the shuttle program and stuff. And um, So I've been told to read that. Um, there's also a series by uh, an author named Stephen Baxter called the NASA Trilogy. There's Voyage, there's Titan, and there's Moonseed. Um, vo- Moonseed. I know, I know. Mm. That's... <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> Don't judge a book by its title. Anyway, <laughs> here's the summary of Moonseed: uh, a mysterious substance called Moonseed, quote, is brought to Earth in a moon rock that begins to destroy the planet. So maybe we figured out coronavirus. I don't know. Maybe we figured it out. It's Moonseed. Oh, that does sound kind of bad, but okay. It's, yeah. Moving on. Um, <laughs> the book uh i've been told the book to read in that series i haven't read any of that that series but uh, i've been told the book to read in that series is called voyage i've been told it's a really fun alternate history about like apollo skylab and shuttle sort of like for right. all mankind sort of in that same vein so i've been told to read that one i, I haven't read it yet it's available on kindle for about seven dollars here so i might just uh buy it tonight or something the current people who are writing uh space alternate space histories the guy i've probably read the most is uh is well he's a friend of mine he's uh jerry brennan gerald brennan and he's written uh several alternate space histories and they're excellent he does a lot of research you know before during and you know during the writing process um he really tries to go out of his way to interview the people that were involved in the specific programs so he gets kind of a good flavor of what they're really like. I, I got hooked from the first two books I read of his. And um, the first one is Public Loneliness. And that's Yuri Gagarin's Circumlunar Voyage. So, Oh, nice. Yes. Um, the second one is called Zero Phase. And I don't want to spoil it too much. But what if Apollo 13 had happened while they were walking on the moon? Right. Okay. So, yeah. Um, the third one, and um, I really was obsessed with this book. Like I, I, I read this book uh, several times. Is uh, I think it's amazing. Is Island of Clouds, and it is about the first uh, crewed mission to Venus in the early 1970s. And this was an actual concept that NASA had uh, bandied about in the late 60s as part of Apollo applications. Like, oh, okay, we'll fly a mission. To Venus, you know, and uh, it's based on a lot of real things that ha- I don't want to spoil it too much because uh, you have to read it. It's really a nail biter. So I really loved it. And um, he's also releasing a new book in April called Infinite Blues. I don't want to give too much of it away because it's not yet released. I've seen some of it and it's you're going to love it. It's really awesome. And it deals with a uh, another kind of unsung program that's not really gotten a lot of uh, ink. So I think you guys will love it. There is a writer, uh, David S.F. Portry. He is a space historian. Uh, You may have seen him on Twitter a lot. He Mm -hmm. hasn't, um, I'm not familiar with his, um, if he's written any alternative space history or not, but he does write a lot about alternate space history in terms of like programs. Like what if Skylab had flown past, you know, 1973. 374 you know he does deal with a lot of topics like that so um he does have a a space history blog and it does i if you're into that i would definitely read that it's a lot of fun there's a book that uh recently came out it's written by david oaks i do have a copy of it i have to read it so david if you're listening i do need to read your book but it's called apollo rising and it is an uh, um an alternate apollo history and um, I think it centers like on a main, like a main character. Yeah, you've mentioned this one before. I think you mentioned this when it came out in an earlier podcast. So, yeah. Yeah. So um, I think it centers like on a central, sort of on a central character. So um, I still need to read it, and I, I have it sitting right here. So I, I need to get to it. Is my book list is like ridiculous right now? It's really yeah, sad. Same. It's really I'm <laughs> so behind on like books. Like I, like I get books to review, and I'm like I just. I need to read them like it's just, you know, you, but you only have so much time in a day, but I need yeah. to get to it. Um, another writer, somebody who's really just kind of sprung onto my radar recently is uh, there's a gentleman who uh, has a, a blog on Medium. 
His name is Reese Emmett, and uh, he does a lot of alternate Apollo. What if, you know, an alternate Skylab, an alternate? What if the Saturn V have had in the Saturn One B had kept flying, and what if they had sort of upgraded those vehicles? And you know, and uh, he also did an amazing alternate history about Judy Resnick. Oh, nice! Yes, he did a. Inc- Incredible. I mean, I was reading it. I was like getting emotional. I'm like, oh my god, I wish this had actually happened. He's designed. I think I've seen this. Like, he's actually did, like done a mock Wikipedia page for her, for for her or something like that, yes. hasn't he? And uh, an alternate history where she's still alive. She became a trailblazer. She became the first woman to uh, command a space vehicle, which uh, mm. you know sounds kind of outlandish. She was a she was a scientist and a mission specialist, so she wasn't classified as a pilot but uh the way it reads is i mean it's believable because she was very brilliant so she probably could have done it just fine she knew how to fly a plane but um yeah it's just brilliant because it's just like oh i wish it seems plausible so i just i just love it and uh, you have to read it so um and he's got a blog on medium and i think he just started it recently so uh if y'all are out there if you're on medium go follow that one yeah, so those that's really all I can think of in terms of books right now. Um, of course, there I have something kind of funny mentioned on here. Um, if anybody can find locate any of these, uh, they're they're kind of hard to find for cheap. But uh, there was a series in like the early '60s, late '50s called Mike Mars, and um, Mike Mars is like a the arc, you know, archetypical american astronaut you know like he's right. apple pie loves the united states you know yeah right loves his mom you know just just really clean cut in the united i don't know if you guys had this over in the uk but we had a um, a series called the hardy boys in the united states and it yeah, was i read loads of those books when i was okay a kid. yeah it's kind of like the you know the nice boys and you know didn't get into trouble yeah. tried to solve mysteries type of stuff well, yep, yep, yep. Mike Mars is that, but he's got spaceships and um, <laughs> nice. and there was a series in the early 60s and it was it was marketed towards mainly young boys or teenage boys. Mike Mars went on a lot of adventures and I have one of uh, the Mike Mars uh, adventure books sitting right by me. It's uh, Mike Mars flies the dinosaur, which is kind of a <laughs> neat moment in time because at that point, the dinosaur... Um, x20 dinosaur had not been canceled yet so it's kind of a neat glimpse into you know what if sort of what if you know this hadn't been canceled you know and it's a kid's book it's it's a kid's book so it's it's kind of silly and the it's really implausible but it's a lot of fun if you can find it and um there are several other books in that series i think he flies the x15 and some several other defunct spacecraft so uh if you can find any of them they're they're a lot of fun, the Hardy Boys, but in space, sorta. Yeah, I need to definitely check some of that out. Um, I've been doing some research recently about um, space diplomacy and how in the sixties the U.S. government were uh, using art, be it that films, books, or even pieces of art, which helped present the U.S. space program to the world, or just get people excited about space around the world, so that when the moon landings happened, people were interested in space. And I'm guessing that some of these some of these things may have been commissioned pieces by the government uh, as part of a propaganda thing to help get that word out. Yeah, and I think also it was to you know appeal to you know kids at the time because around that time. Um, in the United States, I, I can't, I don't know about the rest of the world, but in the United States, there was sort of a big boost at that time, you know, and it's still important. I, I think a well-rounded education is important in all areas, but um, at that time, a big boost really started in the sciences because of space flight in part. Mm. Um, you know, there was more emphasis, you know, like, okay, we should be worried about mathematics and, you know, the physical sciences and stuff like that. You know, so uh, I think those books were sort of a sort of a, you know, something to encourage kids to, you know, work in those areas and try to do well. Mm. So sort of propaganda, sort of propaganda. Proper. Yeah. Propaganda, but also uh, good, good, just inspirational tools for kids as well. Yeah. And they're fun books. Yeah. So they have a double purpose. 
and well, probably more than that as well. So it's all good. Obviously, I will put links to all of these things, or just a list if I can. If I can't find a link, I'll put links to all of this in our show notes. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, Dave, but I did forget um, a trilogy that I, I meant to mention earlier, and I had it written down in my notes. Um, there is a trilogy by Mike Jenny, um, which deals with the Gemini program, and um, it is called the it's the Blue Gemini trilogy, and it basically deals with. Um, sort of reconnaissance and stuff like that and spying things like that in the cold war it's a lot of fun there's three books in that series uh of course blue gemini is one of them i think uh the second one i think is called pale i think it's called pale blue and there's another one called a blue darker than black so um yeah that's an excellent trilogy and it's uh very heavily based in the idea for kind of that surveillance reconnaissance type Gemini missions in the mid 60s which which wasn't which wasn't beyond the realms of of true fiver you know that there was those those extra capsules made and the Vandenberg launches that yes. were being planned uh, for the air force with that with that in mind so yeah exactly when these things are based on things which could have happened it does does give him that extra bite yeah uh, in my opinion yeah this was definitely something that was uh bandied about and in the works it's heavily based on a lot of the data from that time. So yeah, it's, it's a great read and it's sort of, it's, I like the fact that he wrote about um, the Gemini program just because it's really underrated. I think because it only happened for about mm, 18 months, about a year and a half. Yeah. And um, you don't hear it talked about a lot because it, it was very short and it's sort of viewed as like a stepping stool to Apollo. Yeah, it gets it gets glossed over in in documentaries. It gets glossed over normally as a montage. Yep, it's uh, the montage series. It's, it's the, the montage mon- sequence. It's the montage with some music. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And I can almost guarantee what clips they're going to use as well. What what I do like about these things, and and I think if I was a writer, I would enjoy looking at some of the the programs, especially when you go back to the sixties. Some of the programs that were were banded around. There were so many ideas of how to use things that didn't end up happening. For example, there was talks about, uh, with the Gemini capsule, about using that for some moon moonshots. Yes. Uh, and, and things like that. And so that you can just look at those plans, which exist. The, the, all the drawings are there. All the technical stuff is there. And you can use that to create a whole piece of fiction and it's based on some truth. And I think that's what's exciting about uh about for me and for mate probably for you as, a, as someone who could go on and write these kind of things is this information exists and therefore it can as I said earlier it can make these stories give them some kind of element of truth or a- element of this could have happened which I think makes it a bit more dramatic as well in the storytelling you get a good story along with Oh, but this could actually have happened, and it's exciting. I'm gonna. I want to go through and read some of these. Uh, some of these books, but yeah, I'm looking forward to season two of For All Mankind because that that to me that season one was just fantastic. Yes, yeah. I I I still I can't stop watching. Like, uh, oh god, I'm an emotional sap. I'm sorry. My favorite episode from um the first season was uh, when Molly Cobb walked on the moon because I wanted that yeah. to be so real. I was like, I wish we'd had a woman during Apollo, even though. You know, obviously that did not happen. I just, I just loved it. I was like, oh my God. I felt, even though it obviously was not real, it was a construct done in the episode. I just was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. You know, you just felt like they finally gave us a chance (laughs) or something. Yeah. It was incredible. So I loved it. Yeah. They did a really good job with the, with the female storylines within that and how they incorporated women within the space program, because obviously that didn't happen back then at all. Although there was the Mercury 13, which was being talked about, it was nowhere near yeah. actually happening in real life. But what they've done is they've managed to make a real reason to have women in the program, and it works. It's not just a case of them ticking a box saying, yeah. we're a modern TV program that needs to have more women. This makes sense, and you can see how it w- could have potentially happened that way in real life. And I think that's what makes it so plausible and also more exciting as a story it could have happened this way yeah and um exactly and what i loved about the women characters and for all mankind was that they were real people like they weren't glammed up and this sounds so critical and mean but it, it but it isn't but like in the right stuff 
the the TV series. You know, John Glenn is sort of portrayed as like I know he probably was not like this in real life, but in the TV show, he's kind of portrayed as, you know, apple pie and, you know, mom and dad and just, you know, just right down the line and Mr. Marine and stuff like that. You don't get a sense of him almost as a real person, <laughs> as bad as that sounds. Yeah. You yeah. get a sense of like Chris Kraft is a real person because he burned his hand, but you get, you, you know, I don't know. John Glenn seems sort of like, you know, sort of distant, I guess. And whereas in For All Mankind, the women have issues. They're not perfect. They're not glammed up, you know, which I really yeah. love. There's just so many TV series, not just space related, but just with women in them. And I'm like, why is she wearing an evening gown and like diamond earrings? Why? Like nobody goes to the store like this, you know? I don't know. No, no, I I agree. It's it, it, it's more more realistic to what would have happened. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I liked how they made Molly Cobb a real person who, you know, isn't perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I feel like I need to rewatch it before the new season comes out just to remind myself uh, of where we're at because when you're using a world which is so close to the one we know and love, yes. <laughs> I have to remind myself of what's actually happened. So um, that that's a, a little look for those of you who may never have considered the idea of being entertained by an alternative history before. Maybe give them a chance um, yeah. because I think I think it's a I think it's an interesting uh, subgenre uh, of fiction. And historical fiction. Yes, uh, I agree. And obviously, you know, <laughs> this sounds so negative. We're going through some tough times in the world right now, you know, and some crazy stuff. And I don't want to get too political, but I think we could all use a, a brief escapism. Es yes, we could all use an escape right now. So these yeah. are great. Um, it, these are great things to do if you just want a vacation in space for a little Exa while. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. When, yeah, exactly. Hey, That's all we've got time for this week, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our little look at the fictional side of space history, and if you have enjoyed it, consider pressing that share button. Oh, yes, that would uh, that would be lovely. Thanks, uh, thanks for anyone who considers doing that. And as I mentioned earlier, we've got some big plans for this year, and uh, if you want to find out more about them, or if you want to find out about them first and get all the extra content which we're planning on making, I suggest you become part of our Patreon page. Uh, you can find out more at patreon.com forward slash space and things, and uh, as well as getting some extras, this is a great way to support the show and helps us to be able to do some pretty cool stuff in the future. Uh, of course, you can also support the podcast by buying a t-shirt or donating directly on our website too, which is spaceandthingspodcast.com. Uh, but if all you want to do is listen, that's fantastic too. And we thank all of you for doing just that. Yes, thank you very much for listening and we hope you'll enjoy us again next week. But remember, in space, no one can hear you mean. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.